My name is Kevin. I am a first-generation college graduate, and I am one of the 800,000 undocumented students that have benefited from the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, also called DACA. Now, undocumented migration is not unique to the United States. According to the Center for Migration Studies, there are close to 250 million migrants all over the world. There are about three point, that makes up about 3.4% of the population, and about 50 million of those are considered to be undocumented or irregular migrants. Here in the United States, there are close to 11 million undocumented or irregular migrants. And you might think about why would somebody leave their country, risk their lives to go somewhere else? Well, similar to the pilgrims in 1620, when I came to the United States, I came with a purpose. And I always remember Viktor Frankl's quote, one of the, one, uh, a Holocaust survivor, that said, if you know your why, then you can endure anyhow. Migrating to this country, my purpose and the purpose of my family was to connect with our parents, connect with my father in particular. You see, my father, one of 12 brothers and sisters, grew up working his father's land and didn't have a chance to a formal education very late in his 20s. And in 1995, 1996, there was a big economic downturn in Mexico that forced my father to look for opportunities somewhere else in order to provide for his kids and his wife. So he came to the United States. Seven years later, after many lost birthdays and Many at bats that my father didn't get to see me take. We're big baseball fans in the family. My mom decided that it was time to bring the family together. So we didn't cross the border out of necessity by itself. We crossed the border out of love. Because I remember the two nights and the two days that we spent crossing the Arizona desert. I always known about my status or lack of status, I should say. It was very tough for me to make a community in high school because I didn't, want to get, I didn't want people to get too close to me. I didn't want them to know a lot about my history and my past because I felt a little ashamed about it. Also, I was just afraid. So you would find me at the media center playing Yu-Gi-Oh! or Pokemon by myself, and then eventually other English as a second language, uh, pro, uh, uh, as a second language student joined me, uh, and we we're talking about folks from former Yugoslavia, Honduras, Mexico, and Puerto Rico, and, and Hong Kong. So we made a little community from there, kind of learning each other as we played, learning English as we played. It wasn't until my 11th year in, 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 in high school, my junior year in high school, that my professor introduced us to the great migration of the 1910s, the Harlem Renaissance, and poets like Langston Hughes. And in one of his poems, Langston Hughes talks about the following question. What happens to a dream deferred? When I read that, I felt that he was talking to me. And I began to wonder, what's going to happen to my dream of going to college after high school? At the moment, I didn't know any other undocumented immigrants that had made it to college. And the price tag just seemed out of range for me and my family to take care of. So my dream of being the first one in my family to go to college indeed was deferred or put on hold when I graduated. Mostly out of three things. No financial aid, no in-state tuition rate that I qualify for, and lack of proper mentorship. That was 12 years ago, and today, a lot of high school students are facing the same questions and the same challenges that I faced back then. Particularly is the first one on in-state tuition. Undocumented students in many states of the United States don't qualify for the same rate as their peers. 
if, I, if a student graduates from a local high school, went to high school for the four years at the, same, at the same place, and then tries to go to the college across the street, in many states, they don't qualify for in-state tuition rates. Take the local university, for example. A one-year tuition is about $7,000. Tuition for an out-of-state student is considered to be $22,000, three times as much. The big reason here, or the big myth, is that undocumented immigrants do not contribute or pay taxes. Well, that is not true. According to the Institute of Taxation and Public Policy, undocumented immigrants contribute about $12 billion in local and state taxes, and they pay an effective tax rate of 5.4%. Uh, my apologies, let me take that back. They pay a, an effective tax rate of 8%. Those who pay the 5.4% 5 .5 are actually those in the 1% uh, that, that make the most money and make the, the top 1%, they pay an effective tax rate of 5.4. In addition, the Institute says that on, if undocumented immigrants are provided legal status, their tax contribution would increase by as much as $2 billion. So what does that mean? It means that undocumented immigrants are contributing by their taxes to public institutions, and in return, their students should be allowed to pay the same fair rate as their peers. Another myth is that undocumented immigrants take advantage of the systems. Well, that is not true, it's quite the opposite. The US systems take advantage of our migrant and undocumented workers. Now, my story as a college graduate and professional now, is not possible in many states. My story is possible thanks to my work, my determination, my not giving up, yes, but it's also in part thanks to in-state tuition or the out-of-state tuition rate or the out-of-state tuition waiver for select high school students in the state of Florida. It is thanks to private institutions like the Dream.us and it's thanks to the DACA program. And with that, I would like to take you through my journey with the DACA program. In 2012, the Obama administration, after many failed attempts from Congress to pass a DREAM Act, and after young student leaders and student advocates pushed for something to be done, executed or passed through an executive order the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. That was in 2012. When I heard the news, man, I was excited. And at the same time, I was nervous because I didn't know if this was for real. Because what I had to do is I had to raise my hand, come out of the shadows and say, hey, I am undocumented, and I think I qualify for this program because I was under 16. I have been in the country since 2007. I passed a very robust, uh, background check, and I had graduated from high school. So I raised my hand, I applied, and in 2013, I received the approval. And with that, I got an employment authorization card that allowed me to work, and I also got a social security number so that I could pay my taxes from those works that I executed. Also, I got to live the real American dream, which is with a social security number, you can get credit, which is what America is all about. In 2014, after the in-state tuition rate, uh, uh, after out-of-state tuition waiver for high school students was approved in 2014, I was able to go to uh, Valencia Community College and pay in-state tuition rate. And just one year after that, I graduated with my associate's degree uh, I had a straight A's in every single one of my classes because when you're paying with your own money, you're a little extra motivated to like get good grades. And I also renew my DACA for the first time. Every two years, DACA recipients need to renew their status. In 2015, I started my bachelor's degree at the University of Central Florida. And then in 2016, 
the, press, the, the uh, election occur, which forced me to cancel a study abroad program that I had planned for, because DACA is a very unstable policy. It has been changing. It has been in, at risk of being removed multiple times. And I wasn't sure what would happen after the election of 2016. So I canceled that study abroad situation. But I didn't give up. 2017 came around. I renewed my DACA for the second time, got my bachelor's degree, and I became the dream deferred. That dream that I had in 2018, 2008, came to full circle in 2017 when I finally achieved what I wanted to do, which was to be the first one in my family to graduate from college. Also in 2017 was the removal or the uh, DACA was rescinded. So while I was celebrating my graduation, I wasn't sure what the future hold. In response to that, four bills were introduced in 2018 in the Senate. All of them provided a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants, like myself, undocumented students. And all of them failed, mostly because of a debate over the border wall and funding for the border wall. Which I would like to ask a question to you right now. Which one do you think makes up for the most undocumented immigrants in this country? Those who overstay their visa? or those who physically cross the border. If you said those who overstay their visa, you are correct. 67% of undocumented immigrants today overstay their visa, and the rest either crossed the border or came in in a different manner. Not many people know this, but this is part of the reason that a border wall just doesn't fix the problem. There's a lot more that needs to be discussed beyond just a wall. With that in mind, we continue with our timeline. And then in 2019, I did my third DACA renewal. This is an important time for me because at this moment, I have been working for, uh, my, I've been at my job, at my professional job for one year. And renewing that was going to dictate whether or not I could continue working in leadership development, helping young student leaders become a better version of themselves. When I was able to renew that, I was able to continue with my mission and my purpose and continue to be a person of great value to this country and to my community. Fast forward to this year, 2020, and DACA is upheld by the Supreme Court. This was a breath of fresh air for many of us. I know it was for me. It brought DACA back to its original status of 2012, where new applicants could apply, I could continue to renew, and if possible, I could apply for advanced parole, which was the only way that I could potentially leave the country and come back safely, as long as I met one of three criteria for my trip. Communitarian reasons, for my job, or for educational purposes. Well, a few weeks after the Supreme Court upheld DACA, the US Department of Homeland Security came up with a new memorandum saying that they were looking into the DACA program once more time. And in the meantime, they would reduce the two-year renewals to be only one year, meaning that every year starting now, when I renew my DACA and my employment authorization, instead of having two years to plan my life, which is already stressful, now I only have one year, which means that every six months after I get my car, I got to start the process again. Another thing that they're discussing is their removal or possible uh, minimizing the advanced parole program. And I want to spend a few minutes on this one here, because advanced parole has given me the opportunity to go back to Mexico, to my first home, and be able to connect with the country that I've left behind. I am a bicultural, binational individual with American roots, Mexican roots as well. Home is here, and home is there. And thanks to advanced parole in 2020, 
I was able to go on a trip with the US Mexico Foundation to learn about my country. But beyond that, I got a chance to do something that I haven't done in over 13 years, which was to give a hug and a kiss to my grandmother. It has been four years since I've been able to see my grandmother in person, and I hope to be able to do it soon again with advanced parole. Better yet, with a permanent solution to the DACA situation, which, as I said before, is an unstable policy that makes our lives very difficult to live and manage. With that, I'd like to finish up speaking a little bit more about what 2020 brings to us, because what does 2020 look like? I am not, I cannot read the future, but one thing I can tell you for sure is that in 2020, we'll be here to stay. And with that, I'll leave you with one final thought from Langston Hughes, where he talks about, oh, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet and yet must be the land where every man is free.